you have your Bibles, would you turn to 1 Timothy? This is our second message in our series of messages as we go through this book today. We continue our study. And I'll begin reading uh, in verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And in just a moment, I'll be reading from verse 12. When I was about 16 years old, I want to share this before we get into uh, our study, and it does relate to it, believe me. Uh, But my mother decided to employ me to paint the exterior of a small rental house that my mom and dad owned. And she said, Rick, she knew I had a lot of activities going on during the summer. She says, you have the summer to complete this task. So she didn't make me do it every single day, but usually two or three days out of the week, I would go and paint. And the big joke was, I wonder how much paint got on the house. I got more paint on me, my mom thought some days, than I actually got on the house. But I'll tell you, I finished it, and I was proud. I thought it looked good. In fact, uh, for uh, a number of months after that, I would ride by that house and appreciate the great job I thought I did. I don't know if anyone else thought so. But I still go by the house, and I'm sure that paint job's been long gone. It's been 40 years now. And I go into Evergreen, and when I look at that house, it brings a lot of good memories. But I was thinking this week, um, while I spent a lot of time that summer painting the exterior of the house, to this day, I have never seen the inside of that little house. And we're going to look today at Paul's inside religion. We're going to look at what Jesus Christ did inside. Last week, we did a comparison of uh, the teachings of the false teachers. And much like the Pharisees that Jesus described, they were like whitewashed walls, focused on the outside, but not knowing what was going on on the inside. But not Paul. Look at verse 12 of chapter 1. I give thanks to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an arrogant man. Now, Paul's past, we know this. He actually hunted down Christians to have them killed. He thought he was doing well in that. But now, as a Christian, he looks back and realized he was a terrible man in so many ways. But he says, but I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them, but I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, as we look to this latter part of, and middle part of chapter 1 today, we thank you, Lord, that you're a God who cares about the heart, And Lord, you're a God that desires and delights in transforming people from the inside out. Father, we confess to you, those of us who have trusted you, that all too often we forget the great places you brought us to, the great salvation that has been brought about through Jesus' death. Lord, stir our hearts today for those of us who have trusted you, that Lord, we would resolve to to embody in our lives these two things that every Christian should embody that we'll see today. And Lord, if there be any here today who do not know you, I pray today would be the day of salvation. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Last week, we looked at the beginning of 1 Timothy, and again, you may remember the comparison that we made between the true gospel message and the message that was being propagated by false teachers. There were false teachers, and there were also recipients of false teachers in the church at Ephesus where Timothy was placed, and and their teaching really did nothing to change a person. I mean, there were intellectual arguments, arguments over the law, debate over genealogies and uh, mysteries and things like that. But remember, we talked about the fact that it was like cotton candy religion, no substance. When people left that teaching, there was nothing that could attest to the power of God in those things. But in contrast, we noted the gospel message. And last week, the key verse that we looked at, helping us to understand the nature of the gospel, is verse 5, where he says, Now the goal of our instruction, Paul is saying, is love. Love being that inward emotion. But notice what it says, love that comes from what? A pure heart. That's internal. A good conscience, the inner part of our being in a sincere faith. And so Paul very clearly there contrasts the true Christian message, which is a message of inward transformation from what the false teachers were presenting, just a bunch of genealogies in external, for lack of a better job, a word, paint job. And so today, Paul continues to follow along that line in speaking of how the gospel impacted his life, and he shares a personal testimony. Paul was always ready to share the reason for the hope that was in him. And so he shares a personal testimony of the amazing grace of God that was affected to him. In verse 14, he spoke of how the grace of our Lord superabounded or overflowed uh, toward me. And so as he begins to share this, we see that Paul, years after his conversion experience on the road to Damascus, is still amazed that God would even think of him. And so understanding for us the mercy and grace of God should bring about the same attitude that we would Uh, rejoice in and celebrate and give glory to God in his saving work in our lives. We're going to see today two things that should be true of every Christian. They should just be a natural outflow of our life. But before we do that, I want to look at the two words that really Um, Paul was amazed as he considered. The first is grace. He speaks of God's grace uh, overabundantly flowing through his life. In other words, Paul was living his life on that Damascus road, and he was working against God, yet God took such interest in him, he came to him individually. Jesus spoke to him. And through the help of a, an, a human instrument, Ananias, Paul came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He understood what the grace of God is. Grace is God's unmerited favor. And we've heard that acrostic, whatever, whatever, God's riches at Christ's expense. It is God giving us the good that we do not deserve. It's not merited. It is a bestowal from God. And if you're a Christian today, you are a recipient of the grace of God. But we also see the mercy of God. Even though he was a former blasphemer, a persecutor of Christians, an arrogant man. Even though Paul was all of these things, Paul said, but I, Paul, receive mercy. Mercy is God's gracious act in this. It is God withholding his rightful judgment from us. And so as Paul is speaking here, he's speaking about the God of mercy and God of grace. He's honoring, he's glorifying him. And he's saying, I want you to understand what God has done in my life. And so as he shares that, he communicates a great truth of the gospel, and it's amazing. We may not be able to grasp all of the atonement. It is far beyond what we can understand, but, but, but we can understand this. 
Through Jesus' death on the cross, God took our sin and its consequences and transferred them onto the person of Christ. Uh, we've talked the last few weeks, uh, I shared in Sunday school today, often we do not realize the weight of Christ on the cross. But imagine all of the sin that came before him, all of the sin from the time Jesus was on this earth to now, and all of the future sin was placed on the person of Jesus, and he took upon believers our sin. But in exchange, what did he do? He credited to us his righteousness. That we ought to be shouting about that, the great exchange, uh, God taking upon himself our debt and giving us his righteousness, his imputed righteousness. I wonder this morning, have you experienced God's mercy and grace? Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. You can do so today. Uh, last night, uh, I, I was sharing with the young guys a devotion and being the spiritual pastor I was, I showed up ready to eat, but I forgot my Bible. <laughs> By the grace of God, I had memorized Psalm chapter one. I think I did okay with it. I wanted to go in that direction anyway. But after I shared briefly from Psalm chapter one, um, I began to share my personal testimony. Well, why did I share that with these children? Because they're old enough to believe. The gospel is profound in its influence, but it is simple to understand. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, you can do so today. It is believing Jesus died for you, giving your life to him. But for some of us today, we have believed. We have trusted in Christ, and when we trusted in Christ just as a marriage commitment we might make or whatever, it is uh, a sure thing. We are committed to that, and when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you entered a covenant relationship with the Lord. Today, as we look at Paul's example, I want you to see with me three things that should be true, or two things, rather, that should be true in your life today, two things. First, you should live a God-honoring life. That should be your consuming desire. I can't tell you what to do or what not to do in a lot of neutral situations. You might say, do I go here? Do I go there? Do I eat here? Do I eat there? Uh, do I make this simple decision or this complex decision? Uh, I can't tell you what to do on that, but I can tell you this. Every day, you should live a God-honoring life. In the year 1896, Parmel Hartsall wrote the words to a hymn still sung today. Uh, a man named James Fillmore put to music the lyrics for I Am Resolved. And Hart saw a Baptist, and not many Baptists wrote hymns, but some did. He wrote this song for a missions conference in San Francisco, and shortly thereafter, I Am Resolved uh, filled every hymn book. I like the first verse. It says, I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight, things that are higher, things that are nobler. These have allured my sight. The, the writer of that song said, I am resolved. I am placing my line in the sand. I am determined to live my life for the Lord. And that was Paul's resolve here. He writes about a life that was changed. Paul's writing about his own life. And in this part, again, he gives his personal testimony to the wonderful mercy and grace of God and the testament that he has regarding himself is that he would live a God-honoring life. You might ask, Pastor, how can I honor God? God in my life. There are three things we see in the text here, I think, that are very clear. First, Paul would remember what God had done for him. And he was remembering it, wasn't he? He was still excited about his salvation experience. You know, someone repeated to me uh, a funny saying that we've all heard, old age is not for sissies. And I sort of laugh at that. My ankle has been giving me a little trouble. Scott was going to give me a ride back to uh, the campsite last night. And you know, pride for me, I wouldn't do it. But uh, as we get older, things break down. My grandfather was hard of hearing. I can remember visiting 
interesting. It was my mom's dad in the hospital one time, and they had over his uh, bed Randall Woldridge, hard of hearing. And I read it to my papa. I said, Randall Woldridge, hard of hearing. He said, huh? <laughs> I said, well, they were right. Sometimes we lose our sight. But you know, one of the things we most often lose is our memory. But you know, you don't have to be old to forget things, do you? Sometimes we forget to appreciate those we're closest to. Sometimes we forget the things that God has brought us through. One of the most sobering parables that Jesus wrote was the parable of the unmerciful servant. And you may remember that. Jesus told this story to relate a spiritual truth. And the, the parable was this, a man owed a great debt to an individual. And this, and he was standing before this man, and rightfully the debt was so great that he could have been incarcerated for years. He had no way to pay the debt. To put it uh, very simply, he was in a troublesome situation. But as Jesus begins to tell the parable, the man who was to receive the great debt showed compassion toward that man, and he forgave the debt and set the man free. It would have been great if the parable had ended there, but we would have missed the point. The man who had been forgiven a debt, which in our economy would have been like hundreds of thousands of dollars, immediately went out and found someone who owed him a few dollars. Maybe he had loaned him something to get food or whatever, but it was just a small, not even a day's wage worth of money. And he said, you servant, you pay me back. And I think the scripture says that he actually began to strangle the guy. And you think, how could someone who had been forgiven a million dollars leave out of that place and go right to another person that owed a few dollars and hold them to every single cent of it? It's called human nature. Too often, we don't appreciate and stop and realize the great debt that has been paid. We studied in Sunday school today about the non-perishable gold and silver, but how we were redeemed, what? By the precious blood of Christ. Paul didn't make that mistake. Paul was able to grasp how much he was forgiven. I want you to understand that. Paul never forgot what it meant to be saved. He never forgot what a wretched sinner he was and is. And you can read through verses 12 through 13, and it's a list to the greatness of God and the sinfulness of himself. And he concludes that part, verses 12 through 15, by saying, this saying is trustworthy, deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. For some of you listening today, you're saved. You're not convinced of that. You say, well, that's a Paul. He did that. Yeah, he persecuted Christians. Some of you, maybe you were saved at a young age. You don't have a spectacular testimony of God delivering you out of a particular lifestyle, but I want you to understand, I don't care if you are a hardened criminal or if you were a five-year-old child that the worst thing you've done is maybe tell, tell a little fib. You, when you trusted Christ, moved from darkness into light, and it's a miracle. And sometimes we forget the truth that when we were saved as a young child, when we were saved as a young child, not only did God save us, but maybe he saved us from decisions in the past rather than out of decisions. It's a great work of God, his grace. And so it is up to us. Our responsibility is to remember what God has done for us. But I want you to see a second thing that we're to do. We're to thank God for what he has done. That's what Paul did. Paul would live a life of gratitude. The great Old Testament salvation act is a very teachable moment for us as Christians. You may remember it. God delivered Israel out of bondage in Egypt. 
I mean, God showed great favor to the nation of Israel. When he sent the plagues, the scripture was very clear. He discriminated. He protected Israel and sent the judgment on the Egyptian nations. He was upset with Egypt for enslaving the Israelites. And when the exodus happened, God did a miracle that was amazing, parting the waters, allowing Egypt to go through, uh, Israel to go through unscathed. And then when Egypt tried to follow in, the waters caved on them. And I thought, what would it be like to see God's deliverance? You would think Israel would be grateful, but you're wrong. A short time after that, in Exodus chapter 16, they were in the wilderness, and what were they doing? Complaining. They were grumbling. We don't have good food to eat. I wish, even to the point they said, could we go back to Egypt the way life was? They were ungrateful. One of the greatest witnesses a true follower of God can have is a grateful heart, a, a, a spirit of gratitude. God, forgive us for how often we complain as believers, when we should be grateful for what you've done for us. But I want you to see a third thing, and this is important. Not only would he remember and not forget, he would rehearse what God had done for him. Not only would he be thankful, but he would seek to glorify God in his life. Look at verse 17. He gives a doxology. Uh, Delxa means glory. He's glorifying the Lord. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. In other words, he was rehearsing and reciting all God had done for him personally. And then he said, and I'm going to put a close to this part of it by saying, God, you be glorified in all things. Paul's life focus, whether it be through words as in verse 17 or through his life, was to bring glory to God. I was thinking this week, what are some areas in which we are to glorify God? Well, first, if you have children and how you raise your children, you, do you ever uh, stop and thank God you have given me these children? God, they're a sacred treasure. I want to honor you by how I raise. I want to raise my child to believe in you. I want to pray for my grandchild to believe in you, for my niece, for my nephew. It's how we impact the next generation. We're also to glorify God in how we work. A Christian should be the hardest worker. A Christian should have the most positive attitude. We ought to seek to glorify God in our work. And in Colossians, it says that whatever you do in word or deed, verse 17 and verse 23, both focus on that. Do all for the glory of God. When you wake up tomorrow morning, and be honest, you may not feel like getting up saying, God, I want to glorify you in my work today. In the church, glorify God. The church is the Lord's. It's not the pastors. It's not the deacons. It's not the teachers. This is the Lord's church. We ought to seek to glorify him. How do we glorify him? Well, one way is by obeying his word, by adhering to his word, by, by obeying his standard, by being a mission-oriented church that's in, invested in ministries outside of its walls. We're to glorify God in our choices, the choices that we make every day, the big choices and what we may consider to be the small choices. Lord, I want to honor you, glorify you in this through the use of our gifts in ministry. Many of you, we're gifted. You're gifted. There are ways that you can be used in God's kingdom, your gifts. You glorify God in it. And so we see we're to remember, we're to give thanks. And we're to lift up God in every area of our life. That sort of sums up that first aspect of what we're to do. We're to be God-focused. But I want you to see the second. We should be a witness to the mercy and grace of God. One thing that's happened during COVID, and I felt convicted, and it's not an excuse, it's an explanation. We haven't been doing the work of ministry as we all. We've not been in in people's homes. We've not been sharing the gospel as we ought. We need to, to revive in us that God's Spirit would revive a spirit 
to communicate the gospel. Remember the question we're asked, what is to be true of me if I'm a follower of Christ? And the answer is this, we should be others-centered. We should be focused. Jesus gave his great command, which is twofold, that we're to love him with our whole being and we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. We have no choice as Christians. We are to live our lives with a view toward others. Look at Paul's attitude in verse 16. After sharing that prominent verse 15, he says, but I received mercy, period, no. But I see, receive mercy for this reason, so that, a purpose clause, this is the purpose, I receive mercy. Not so that I can say I'm saved and go sit down in my own circle and rejoice in that. No, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Paul said the purpose of God expressing mercy to me and saving me is that I would be a witness to others. Simply stated, Paul wanted his changed life Life, to be an impetus for other people to believe. Paul said that what he hopes from his life is this, listen, that people would look at him and say, man, if God could save a sinner like that, he can certainly save me. Isn't that a different, this is a man that wrote almost half of the New Testament, but many times we go and we think, boy, I'm a righteous person, and people see right through that. People don't need to see us. They need to see Christ. They don't need to see a fabrication. They need to see sincerely that God saves even the worst of sinners. I have a book at, at home in which I collect a number of quotes from believers through the ages. One offered was by a man named Adoniram Judson who served as a missionary in Burma, which is, I believe, currently Myanmar. But he said this, tell me, how could I in the hereafter, I mean, face God's charge? I gave you one opportunity to tell them of me. You spent it painting your own adventure. You and I are saved for a purpose, not to live our own adventure, but we're saved in order to bring glory to God. And one way we bring glory to God is by speaking his praises sharing testimony with others. You know, whenever I return home from uh, foreign mission trips, um, I can remember vividly getting off the plane just about each time and how glad I am to receive home, be, be back home. In fact, I was especially glad to get back on the Eastern time zone this, this past one. But you know, I realize what a blessing it is to live in this country. One of the best ways you can appreciate it is go live in a place that's impoverished like many of the places some of you have been. And when I come back, I remember for a few days, I'm just so grateful. I mean, we're in one part of the world. I can't list the, the place because I don't want to jeopardize if, if this is online. Um, but when we were there, you couldn't get to one McDonald's in three or four hours, all right? And we can go to Farmville and have anything we want. And I realize how blessed we are, how many convenience we have for a while. But then I, what happens? I get caught back in the routine, and I just consider all of this is just my reality. How different it would be if I could live like those first two days coming all the time. You know... The Bible tells us, spiritually speaking, that angels long to look into our experience with God. Now, uh, fallen angels were sinful. They were cast out of heaven long ago. But the angels that are in God's company, the scripture says, they long to look. Now, I don't think there's jealousy, but there's intrigue. These celestial beings, as they're considering our salvation, they know God's holiness, but they've not experienced the love of God to the extent we have. They haven't sinned, these unfallen angels, and so they understand the, the majesty, but I, I think there's part of them that's intrigued, not jealous, but saying, I wonder what it's like to mess up like those people. 
to be selfish, to be mean, to have attitude, to be self-serving, yet to experience the grace and the mercy of God. They long to look at it. Heavenly beings have not experienced it, yet we take it for granted. Yet I like Paul here because he didn't take it for granted. And we don't have to take it for granted. And we can have a life and live a life that honors God. We can live a life that bears witness to him. We have a choice. That's what we're called to do as saved individuals. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your glorious gospel, your amazing grace. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for taking for granted this great and precious salvation that you have given to those of us who believe in you. Lord, how we need that wonder that Paul had. Paul was just amazed that you would appoint him, a former blasphemer and persecutor, to do your ministry. Father, forgive us when we are consumed with our own, what we consider to be right acts, Lord, help us to see ourselves as we truly are in need of your inward cleansing. Father, there may be some here today who have never trusted you. Give them the boldness to step forward today and to say, I want what Paul had. I want that inner transformation that only God can bring in my life. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to close the final hymn.